Joe, are we good to go? Yeah. Yeah, we're live. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, Trade Union and Labour Party Liaison Organisation um, event this evening to look at defending and extending our rights at work. And I'm delighted to be joined this evening by three fantastic guest speakers. Uh, we have Andy MacDonald, MP, the Shadow Secretary of State for Employment Rights, Victoria Phillips, Head of Employment Rights at Thompson's, and Shelley Asquith, the TUC Health and Safety Officer. Um, I think it goes without saying that most people know that the government have been forced to scrap a plan to review our rights at work after their plot was exposed and re they received fierce backlash from trade unions, Labour MPs and the public. But the cat is out of the bag and their long held desire to water down workplace rights, including on working time, inclusive of time spent on call, rest breaks and paid holiday entitlements have been revealed. Working people are putting themselves in harm's way every day to keep this country fed, safe, cared for and connected and keeping our country going under unimaginable pressures with insecurity rife throughout much of our economy. This pandemic should be a turning point where rights at work are strengthened. So I'm delighted that you've decided to join us this evening. I'm Paula Barker, I'm the Labour MP for Liverpool Wavertree. Um, and we will um, hold the event till 7 p.m. this evening. If you'd like to ask any questions, if you can put that into the chat facility and we'll do our best for our fantastic panel of speakers to um, answer them. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to move to our first guest speaker this evening. As I've said already, Andy is the Shadow Secretary of State for Employment Rights. Um, a fantastic comrade in Westminster uh, to me. Uh, it's a privilege to work alongside him. So, uh, Andy, you're very welcome at the event this evening, and it's over to you. Thanks, Paula. Uh, uh, it's a lovely introduction. I'm very grateful to you. Um, uh, and thanks for the invite. It's great to be on such a, a great panel. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from my fellow speakers. But, um, I, of course, uh, uh, Vicky and I go back a uh, a long way from our days in, in Thompson. So it's lovely to, to, to be on a platform um, and sort of re renewing those old acquaintances. Um, it's extremely timely that we're having this discussion today. There's been so much going on, uh, but of course it was only yesterday that I launched our, uh, our task force on recover and reform and power in the workplace. And I'll say a little bit more about it in the in the uh, in a moment but at the the start of this uh, pandemic if i can just reference um the government issued guidance about health and safety in the workplace and i've got to say that it was worse than saying nothing because it muddied the waters uh it used all sorts of opaque language uh that, that sowed confusion they had been if infinitely better served had they said obey the law uh, we do have uh, a, a pack of regulations uh, that address risk assessments and uh, substances and aerosols and things of this nature that are critically important now. And it's working people who have to leave their homes to go into working environments right now who are on the front line. And it's they who are running the greatest possible risks. Um, so uh, it's been appallingly handled uh, uh, from the off, and I regret to say the consequences of that have been dire for, for the working people of this country. Um, just say a word about another current issue, which is about the, uh, you talk about the, the leaking of the plans from Bayes, and I'll touch upon that. But of course, we, we did successfully unearth, and I pay tribute to my own staff uh, on this issue, uh, the Revolution, uh, Resolution Foundation did unearth a discussion around the whole issue of the classification of COVID uh, in terms of its uh, potency by the HSE. And by further digging, we did unearth that it was classified by the HSE as being a significant risk as opposed to being a serious risk, that it was 
reversible and not a permanent condition. Well, with 112,000 people, as it was at that time, dead, that is not a reversible condition. It is not an impermanent situation. It was a, an horrendous revelation, but it speaks to a great deal about uh, this government's attitude and its lack of seriousness about the working environment. And it speaks to the age old issue about power in the workplace, which I'm determined to address. And I'm buoyed up to be uh, asked to take on this role by Keir Starmer. It's a huge honor. It's the heart and soul of the labor and trade union movement as far as I'm concerned. And as far as many people are concerned. Uh, and, and what's also uh, buoyed me up is uh, Keir's speech to the TUC in September which he made it abundantly clear that he stands shoulder to shoulder with the trade union movement uh, in pursuit of its objectives, uh, which are objectives that are shared. And we, we've seen that with the solidarity expressed across many industrial disputes over the last several weeks and months. If you think of Rolls-Royce at Barnoldswick, I confess, Chair, that I was really worried about the potential outcome of uh, that dispute. But I was so heartened to see that the hard work and determination of, uh, uh, of those Unite members on that picket line uh, and the decision ultimately made to, 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 to reinforce uh, manufacture on that site and preserve those jobs. Similarly, the work the GMB have done um, uh, in the British gas dispute on fire and rehire. Um, that has been incredible uh, determination to uh, sustain that case. And elsewhere, we've seen Heathrow Airport and, and British Airways and hurrah for the victory there with the uh, cargo workers in that dispute. The whole concept of fire and rehire, the unilateral ability of one party to a contract to be able to say we're going to fundamentally change the terms and conditions, which mean lower pay, less safe work and longer hours. Um, this is an absolute anathema uh, and it's something that we're absolutely determined to fight. And it's, no, it's absolutely no point in referring this to ACAS and encouraging employers from the dispatch box to cease and desist. We need legislation. That we, that's the answer. We need to outlaw fire and rehire and make that abundantly clear. Um, so it's pretty straight forward but it's not just those companies it's not the ones that i've named or, or ess where you've got cleaners who have their terms and conditions turned upside down cleaners who keep clean ministry of defense establishments if the government can't lead here and say that this is not acceptable then uh, it's a uh, it's a pretty poor state of affairs but it's it spreads so that one in ten workers have now had to reapply for jobs on, on, uh, on lower terms. And yes, we did um, unearth this leak from uh, uh, Bayes. And I, I congratulate the work that Ed Miliband did around this subject. But it revealed that there was a settled plan within Bayes to look at the 48 hour working week, to look at rest breaks, as you said, Paula, and holiday pay entitlements. And we, on one day, it was, no, that's not uh, happening. Um, the minister goes before um, uh, the Bayes uh, Select Committee and it's discovered, yes, there is a plan. And then with the pressure that was exerted, it was abandoned. But you can tell that the intention was there. And of course, from a, an incoming Secretary of State who wrote this dreadful tome, that tells us what the Tories think of working people, in which he said that the British are among the worst idlers in the world. And there's worse still. That's what they think of the people who have rescued this country and sustained our economy and kept our public services, our hospitals going through this crisis, that they are idlers. Um, an absolutely outrage, outrageous revelation but that is where they are. Now, this has not gone away simply because Kwasi Kwarteng has said that will not be happening uh, so far as his department is concerned. Because we see, Chair, that Ian Duncan Smith has been appointed 
as chair of the Innovation, Growth and Regulatory Reform uh, Task Force, which is going to uh, go into a deep dive of uh, regulatory reform. Uh, and it's available uh, to everyone. If, it, if, if I can put a link up later, Chair, I will, to the task force. But it should spell, uh, uh, set the alarm bells ringing. We are really worried about what's going to come. So we are going to have the fight of our lives uh, because basic terms and conditions that people have fought long and hard for are going to be under threat. So the launch of our uh, task force is incredibly timely. The pandemic has revealed some awful uh, practices in work, but quite frankly, a lot of them were there before the uh, pandemic hit. They've just uh, accentuated uh, these deficits in the workplace. And it's up to us to make sure that we, we, we uh, uh, tackle them head on. So with our affiliates, I am embarking upon a program uh, taking through section by section. But ultimately, this is about the power in the workplace and about, about power around recognition and collective rights, the ability in, uh, for sectoral collective bargaining uh, to be impactful and uplift people, to raise living standards, but of course, uh, to put demand into the economy. It's, it's economically literate to pursue this. What the government has done for the last 10 years is economic illiteracy. It is absolutely, with the continuation of austerity, it's continuing to do the wrong thing, produce the worst outcomes. And as uh, we had the benefit of speaking with uh, Michael Marmot uh, just a couple of days ago, and his words were truly inspiring, Chair. Um, and he did highlight how so many people have been robbed of dignity in their working lives. And that one word of dignity sums it up. But you know, we want to think about how we um, navigate this, how we communicate these messages uh, more broadly. And, and one of the interesting things he, he did say, almost as, a, as an aside, was that what we have to do is tell the truth about what's gone wrong and be bold about how to fix it. And I, I thought if ever one phrase just encapsulated our mission, uh, that was it. So we have got an incredible program ahead of us. We're threatened with an employment bill that I see no sight of. Um, but if it comes and when it comes, we've got to be ready for it because it, whilst there might be nice things that we could tick boxes, it won't be our bill. So we've got to make sure that we're absolutely ready as a movement uh, to respond to that and put that alternative and have that conversation with the public because you know a better world is possible and a better and new deal for working people is absolutely essential. And I'll close there, Chair, thank you. Thank you, Andy, that was a fantastic contribution. And I can't think of any better colleague to be heading up the task force and taking on this hostile and pernicious government. And I look forward to working with you on this. Um, and prior to enter entering parliament, I had the privilege to be um, a trade union official. And um, one of the things I always used to say is we are better when we are bold. So it's great to hear the words of Michael Marmos. And it is about dignity. It is about getting rid of the scourge of fire and rehire. And Ken has put in the chat about on day one of the Labour government, we must repeal the Trade Union Act. Um, and that's quite right, because obviously we have some of the most um, regressive legislation in the world, to be honest. So we've got um, a real job ahead of us, but I know that you are more than capable of taking that task on and taking the fight to the Tories. So um, I'm delighted to introduce our second speaker this evening, who is Victoria Phillips. Uh, Victoria is the Head of Employment Rights at Thompson's. Um, so, uh, Victoria, it's over to you. You're very welcome and thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you very much, Paula, and thank you, Andy. It's so tempting on these occasions to just start a dialogue. And I've got so many things I want to say from what Andy was saying, but I will stick to my script for once. Um, 
I have to say, seeing the other week, the quasi cartoon stuff, it was like Back to the Future. We've been here before. Uh, very early days, the 2010 coalition government, when they set up their red tape challenge and they got Adrian Beecroft to come in and say, employment tribunals are a mess and people should just be allowed to be dismissed on a whim. Um, and, you know, it's just, as soon as the Tories, even in coalition, feel they are under attack, they start having a go at the workers, whether it's saying we're the laziest in the world, where all the TUC research shows that we work the longest hours than anyone in Europe and probably most places around the world, uh, whether it is uh, attacking these very, very generous rights when all the research shows, sadly, many workers feel forced into signing opt-outs for the 48-hour week. Um, and this narrative is something they obviously feel very comfortable with, but we mustn't forget that this is a pattern. They've done this before, they'll do it again. Remember in 2010, the, the outcome of their red tape challenge and the Beecroft report were two things. One was increasing unfair dismissal um, qualifying period to two years back from one. And the second thing was turning compromise agreements into settlement agreements. And that they were only able to do um, those two things, mainly because trade unions and um, workers very rightly protested about the changes that were being proposed. I think it's really important as trade unionists um, to uh, Labour Party members to remember how fragile and how recent many workers' rights are. I've been in practice for 27 years. When I first started, you had to have two years service to bring an unfair dismissal claim, so no difference there. But also the maximum compensation you could recover was £11,000. And there was no automatic right for any holiday pay whatsoever. So since 1997, we have seen, with the Labour government, we saw huge advances in workers' rights. National minimum wage, working time regulations, age, well, age had come in just before, but sexual orientation, um, no, age, sexual orientation, religion and belief, um, and all those big changes in work and advances for workers' rights. There's still more to do, but we have to remember that those are very recent rights that need um, hard work to preserve. I also think we have to pay tribute to the role that trade unions have paid in um, enhancing those rights and making sure that they were me meant something to ordinary workers. So back to challenge the working time regulations and ensure they applied to all workers from day one um, before you had to have 13 weeks. That clearly badly affected freelance workers. Um, whole range of, I can talk about working time regulations to the end of the evening if, if I had my way, but PCS challenged the fact you couldn't have holiday pay where you're off sick, they won that. UCAT challenged the rules about rolled up holiday pay, they won that. Uh, Unison challenged the rules around sleep and, and carry on um, challenging that. They're, they're having really great successes and Balpa um, challenged the calculation of normal pay and won that. So trade unions have made these rights more meaningful for their members by bringing legal challenges. But what we have to be aware of is most of these rights that I've mentioned are underpinned by EU legislation and EU case law. So I'll come back to that again in a minute. The other thing that is very suspicious for those who read the Times newspaper is the series of articles that have been done in the Times in the recent weeks about the terrible employment tribunal system, the fact that it takes ages to have a case heard in the employment tribunal and that there are all these vexatious claims being brought. Sorry, this is heavy irony. I'm not sure if it comes through with, with Zoom. But again, it's the same narrative that was happening in 2010. 
these, this, these reports are pretty well without foundation, except it is taking a long time to have cases heard in the tribunal. Average waiting time is at least 39 weeks, and we know plenty of um, others that are far worse than that. And of course, if you're a worker having not been paid your holiday pay or not been paid your notice pay, waiting 39 weeks is just simply not acceptable. But Nobody talks about what the reason for that is. The reason is because the Tories have starved the employment tribunal system. They introduced fees and then they used the lack of cases to cut back the judiciary, cut back the lay members. And it's only this year that they started recruiting to replace people who were lost. And that is the real reason for the delay. As for the vexatious claims, this is this is the Tory dinner party conversation, I reckon. They all know someone who's had a terrible case brought against them that never should have been brought. But if you looked at the cases that were reported by the Times, both of them had been dealt with entirely properly by an employment tribunal. They were vexatious claims. They'd been kicked out, costs had been awarded. That's how justice should work. Um, what I think, I, what I wanted to say in terms of the future is it's clear that there's going to be a further attempt to introduce employment tribunal fees, reintroduce employment tribunal fees. The government got it wrong last time, but they're bound to do it again. They've hinted at that for, for some time. They'll probably have to go for primary legislation rather than secondary, but we should be under no illusions about the terrible um, barrier to justice that would be to working people if those fees were reintroduced. The, there's also a bigger picture of other rights that are at risk and it seems to me that anything that is not uh, all those rights that have got an uh, EU underpin are at risk. That means things like discrimination law compensation, um, the unlimited nature of that, that came from Europe six years back pay or five years for uh, in Scotland for equal pay. That's an EU underwrite. That'll also be under attack. Um, collective consultation. You know, we're talking about the fire and rehire, but if the Tories had their way, they'd completely scrap Section 188 and the requirement to consult employers about redundancies, um, both in the context of redundancies and TUPI. So we need to be very wary of that and also I suspect information and consultation will will be under attack. We've seen what they're doing about the gender pay gap reporting. They clearly don't think that's important. We know it's really important that we monitor the difference between men and women's pay or else we cannot see the real inequalities that have grown, particularly in the pandemic, but which will continue to grow for women. Um, and the I would say something about what we want to see rather than what we want to defend. But what we want to see is, of course, rights for all sorts. Of, every sort of worker deserves day one rights not to be unfairly treated, not to be unfairly dismissed. Trade unions need to have access to workplaces automatically so they can negotiate and so consult on behalf of their members. And there needs to be a way, a, a better, we need to do some thinking about collective enforcement of rights so that we're not reliant on individuals um, putting their heads above the parapet and waiting 39 weeks for their case to be heard. So thank you very much for listening to me. I'm sorry, um, I probably overran, I always do, uh, but it's lovely to be here and um, have an opportunity to talk to you all. Thank you, Victoria, again, a wonderful contribution and um, highlighted, you know, only too well that when, you know, the, the tribunal fees are in, it is about access to justice. So many people are cut off um, and it is about uh, dignity and, um, you know, the trade unions do a wonderful, wonderful job. Um, and that's why I'm delighted uh, to introduce our next guest who is uh, Shelley Asquith from the TUC and it's um, even more pertinent that Shelley is with us this evening because obviously this week is I Heart Unions Week um, and I'm sure most of our participants with us this evening are trade union members. Um, the question I pose is if you're not, why not? Um, make sure that you go out and that you sign up for a trade union. Um, I know that 
obviously it's difficult if people are unemployed what well, unite for example uh, run a community scheme so you can still be a member of a trade union so um if, if there's one thing that you do today if you're not a member of a trade union already please sign up it's really really important so without further ado um i'd like to introduce uh shelly um and i think shelly is going to uh contribute about the physical and mental health toll um that long long hours um, is having on the uh, UK employees and it's obviously all the more pertinent now as well in terms of mental health with the global pandemic and and people working from home or being furloughed so Shelley you're very welcome thank you. Thanks so much Paula and thanks Labour Unions for hosting this tonight. Great plug about Heart Unions Week. It is Heart Unions Week. If you're not a member of a union, please join one. But if you're already a member of a union, please think about a friend or family member who isn't one and try and recruit them. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about working hours and the 48 hour working week, as we've already heard, was one of the rights the government was supposedly putting under review. And for me as a health and safety person, it's absolutely key. And, you know, as a supposed idlers, workers in Britain put in longer hours at work than anywhere else in Europe, as Victoria has already said. And I also think that if some of the Tories got their way, there'd be no limit at all. So while they may have shelved the review, we can't let this go. We need to remind ourselves why working hours are such a key condition of our working lives and take action to improve things, not just defend what we've got. Why is it so important? Well, there are really significant physical health implications to working long shifts, from headaches through to diabetes, even premature death. There are so many health conditions that are statistically more common among people who work long hours. And working long hours has a big effect on our mental health as well. The rate of a whole range of mental health concerns rises the higher the number of hours are worked. And long hours also reduces our time for family, for socialising, relaxing, and therefore generally undermines our quality of life. This isn't just about a risk to the individual worker either, but also to the general public. The number of accidents and injuries has been, there's been found to be um, higher on night shifts uh, and after a succession of shifts or when shifts are long and there are inadequate breaks. Some of the biggest workplace disasters and injuries are linked to overly long shifts. And this is a particular issue for transport workers who make up some of the most sleep deprived professions. Let me give you a case study. The Driven to Distraction report from the London Assembly on bus safety. Now, bus drivers in England and Wales typically work longer hours than any others in Europe. And the report found that among London's bus drivers, 21% had to fight sleepiness at least two or three times a week. 36% had had a close call due to fatigue in a 12 month period. 17% had actually fallen asleep at least once while driving and 5% have been involved in at least one accident in the 12 year, 12 month period due to fatigue. And that's really scary. There's also a wider concern about this in the context of coronavirus. Of course, the main focus of the union movement in the last 12 months has been on our physical health and safety, keeping a distance, ventilation, PPE and all the rest of it. But there's been really significant knock on consequences for our mental health too. And no wonder when British workers have, on average, increased their working week by almost 25% during this pandemic. And that's frontline workers who are shouldering a huge burden, as well as those who are working from home as well. There's a lot we need to improve. Clearly, complying with the working time directive alone isn't enough to manage the risks there already are. What we need, we, what we need is change nationally. We need people working fewer hours, not more. So the TUC supports the call for a four day working week. When we were founded, the average hours worked per week was 62. It is time for change again. What we, what we, um, what we won't do away with though, um, we won't do away with long working hours until we do away with low pay as well, because the desire for long working hours is usually driven by people not having enough money to have a good quality of life if they didn't do it. So we desperately also need a proper living wage. And people um, working so-called unsociable hours should also be compensated for it. The final point I'll make is this. Employers are bound by a legal duty to assess the risks of people's working hours, but it's up to unions to hold them to it. 
There are numerous policy and legislative changes that we need to see. And obviously we need a Labour government to implement many of them. But we cannot wait around for the law to change because even when it does, it won't be enough. We've seen in this pandemic how ready many bosses are to flout the law and how little punishment there is from government or from regulators. So while we have a right to safety at work, the way we actually secure it is by joining a union, recruiting to the union and organising in the union. Collective action has always and will always be the difference between safe and unsafe work. Thank you. Thanks, Shelley. Absolutely great contribution. Um, and as I say, all the more pertinent now with all the um, mental health issues that we see in terms of the pandemic. Um, and of course, one of the things that we must always remember is that health and safety in the workplace as well starts with ourselves. So if we think that something is wrong, we've got to raise that. If it feels wrong, it probably is wrong. So please go and speak to your trade unions and make sure that you get all the protections that you are entitled to. So I'm going to uh, move to questions to our panel now. So thank you to people who've already been contributing in our chat box. We'll get through as many of them as possible before we close at seven o'clock this evening. So um, the first question is from Norman. And the question is, how do we secure the rights of workers not traditionally protected by trade unions. So um, Victoria, I can see you smiling away. So I'm going to start with you, if I may. Thank you. Well, the, there's a very interesting clause in the 1999 Employment Relations Act, which was the piece of legislation which allowed all workers to be accompanied for grievance and disciplinary hearings. And there's this really useful clause. I've forgotten the number. Um, number of it and I won't look it up while we're talking which basically gives the power and it's still in in force for the government to extend by means of secondary legislation rights other rights to designated categories of workers and I've been completely obsessed about this clause for a long time even though I can't remember what it is uh, the number is because it would be such an easy way to protect Classes of workers that weren't even thought about. I mean, OK, gig, gig economy workers are not um, that different from other sorts of um, atypical workers. Um, but what, what needs to be the case is at the moment we have a system which is subject to exploitation by employers. They will draw up a contract which, as can be seen in the Uber case and the delivery case, which tries to put all the obligation on the individual worker and tries to make them not look like a worker and exclude their right to holiday pay and um, other, other rights. Um, and they've got clever lawyers. They'll always be able to afford to have clever lawyers. What we need to do is have a piece of legislation that says all workers in the UK from day one have rights not to be discriminated against, um, to have holiday pay, to be treated fairly, to be covered by a collective agreement, to be covered by health and safety standards. And that is absolutely essential and should happen as soon as possible. Not that I think we can persuade the Tories to do it, but we need to start. The legislation exists. It doesn't need a new piece of legislation. It could just happen. Great. Thank you, Victoria. Shelley, did you want to come in next? Yeah, sure. So the question from Norman was about securing the rights of workers not traditionally protected by unions. I think the main thing would be to protect them, they need to be protected by unions. So getting them into a union is absolutely key. Um, one thing I wanted to also add is that we really need to see extended access rights for union health and safety reps. Now, for those who aren't aware, union health and safety reps are special reps. They've got special rights to investigate hazards, to take part in risk assessment process, to sit on certain safety committees. And what we want to see is them to not only be able to do that in their own workplace where their unions recognise, but to also go to other workplaces where they've got members, but perhaps not recognition, and to go and inspect and investigate hazards there as well. And um, in terms of um, traditionally unprotected workers, I think that's probably implying certain sectors, but I think traditionally unprotected workers is often migrant workers. And so I think 
while we need to be absolutely opposing any attacks on workers' rights, we also need to recognise that this is really linked to attacks on migrants and the hostile environment more generally. And that is something we absolutely have to oppose because any attack on migrants is an attack on migrants as workers. And that means that we're all less protected as a result. That's great. Thanks, Shelley. And Andy, over to you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I mean, it's a brilliant question. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the answers for those who are not traditionally protected by, uh, by unions is, is it, there are several aspects to this. Of course, we want to encourage people to join trade unions. That's part of the I Heart Unions Week that we're engaging in uh, this week. But it also uh, touches upon the issue of the status of those workers. Um, if it is that somebody is uh, a gig worker and they haven't got that, that relationship and that protection um, uh, because of their status, then let's look at that. Let's look at the, how they are exposed and they're exploited and, and, and the economic illiteracy of that for the longer term. That cannot be uh, an acceptable way forward. Um, so let's look at that. But the issue of access at work is access to trade union representation is critical in all of this. When I was Shadow Transport Secretary, uh, I used to engage an awful lot on HS2. Uh, and it, it was a, a, a matter of immense frustration that we were not successful in persuading the contractors uh, engaged in HS2 to provide facilities uh, for our trade unions to access the site and engage with uh, people who were who were working there, the, often that that would be um, honoured by lip service uh, and some uh, 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 scrappy hut uh, on a Tuesday afternoon in the in the back end of the site was on offer, but not open access to the canteen, which is the ordinary way in which people would 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 understand that relationship. Um, and I would also say something around the. Uh, uh, the role of health and safety reps. I mean, Francis O'Grady, through the uh, through the uh, proposition, together with the then uh, Director General of the CBI, uh, Carolyn Fairburn, proposed the National Recovery Council. And what the TUC have said consistently is, you know, there are 100,000 health and safety reps. They could be doing their work, but making their services available to those tier one and tier two subcontractors who don't ordinarily have trade union recognition to be of assistance, not just to the employees of those in the supply chain, but also to those companies who desperately want to comply with the guidelines and with the law, but because of the lack of engagement with trade unions have not been able to discharge their statutory functions in the way that they should. So this is, a win-win uh, for us if we can address that. But on this issue of migrant workers, those people who come in, there's been some terrific campaigns of trade unions going in and standing up for people who have been voiceless. And of course they've won their campaigns and they've secured trade union membership at the same time. So these are the areas in which we can respond and totally transform the environment for every working person in the country. Thanks, Andy. That's great. I'm going to come to you first, Andy, with our next question. Then I'll go to Shelley and then I'll go to Victoria, if I may. So our next question is, um, besides fire and rehire following Brexit and in the current pandemic, another right the Tories are likely um, to come for is Tupi. And Labour extended the protection beyond what the EU required and the condemns described previously as gold placed Tupi, um, which is complex legislation. And um, our question is from Matt. And um, he's basically asking, what can we do to ensure that uh, Tupi is protected? And I know certainly from my days in the trade union movement, it's, it's one of those... Um, pieces of legislation that unfortunately sometimes people think it offers greater protection than it actually does sadly uh, but what can we do to ensure that um, it's it's shored up and less likely to affect some of the red wall Tory voters Matt's asking yeah I mean it's a, it's a, it's a brilliant question I mean it's a, it's a precious and treasured uh, provision and we need to look to enhance it 
Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, talk about gold plate. I'm not convinced that, that is a is an accurate description mm -hmm. of, of what it what it truly is. Um, but it, it cannot be um, uh, beyond our contemplation that we would have protections in place where the ownership of a, an organization uh, changes hands, that those workers' rights are preserved. Their, their service has been preserved and recognized, not only in their terms and conditions, but in their pension rights as well. So it is a critically important area. And if we're to actually reach out as a nation and say that we are standing uh, uh, shoulder to shoulder with working people, that we're on their side, to be part of a conspiracy to detract from their rights and protections would be an abomination. So we, we, we've got to do this. Now, the mechanisms for doing it, I mean, I'll bow to Vicky's greater knowledge in terms of its day-to-day uh, uh, -day practice, uh, uh, but engaging with our task force review, uh, our trade union partners have got this opportunity to uh, address those very protections and and I'm looking forward to receiving those representations and exploring how we can reinforce what we've got and build on it because we it's that that's the task is to build on it to offer that greater security uh, for people in work um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm very interested to hear the responses from Vicky and Shelley on this because it's a it's a fantastic question. Over to you Shelley and then we'll go to Victoria thank you. Thanks, Paula, and thanks to Matt for the question. I think it might be good to, to actually get Victoria to explain what GP is, because one of the things I was going to say is that I think in terms of what we do about it, I think there's a big task ahead of us in making sure people know what their rights are and what these laws are. The idea that it's gold plate is quite funny. It makes me think of it's some sort of like footballer transfer deal where you get more. Um, yes. <laughs> it's literally a basic minimum. Um, so I think a lot of this is about, you know, the, 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 the basic function of unionizing the workforce, getting more people into unions, selling the union, and actually making sure they understand what these rights are so they can be mobilized to protect them. That's great, thanks, Shelley. And over to you, Victoria. Yeah, I won't do a history of GP, because <laughs> um, um, my very first day at Thompson's, I had to sit, sit behind council on a, on a GP case, which involved all sorts of interesting cases like Daddy's Dance Hall and Sophie Sticking and all sorts of things. Uh, it's a very interesting and complex area of law. But I do think one of the things that's very interesting about GP is that there is quite a lot of consensus between employees employers and employees about what it should look like and interestingly when the government um, were going for the gold plating of Chupi which was what they said was gold plating is just an explanation that it can apply to service provision changes as well which is basically you know um, solicitors firm doing a contract for one um, insurance company lose the contract, their workers would transfer um, to the new provider. Um, that provision is what they refer to as gold plating, but actually the employers and all agree that they want that because it's clarity. Um, and the thing about Chupi is that if it operates properly, it should give complete clarity that if people are, if workers are assigned to an undertaking, they should transfer um, to the new employer who takes over that undertaking. The weaknesses of current GP protections are the lack of real um, protections for pension rights. I mean, there are mirror pension right provisions, but they're not nearly as good as your existing provisions. And where people, particularly in the public service, have been contracted in and contracted out multiple times, they find that can be a big knock on their pension. Um, and the other area which is very, uh, is, is also tricky is union recognition. Um, yeah. Because very often, if the contract, the entity isn't the same, you lose the collective recognition. And, you know, this is, this is an area we could really look at, I think, as labour unions about how to ensure that that collective recognition goes with 
um, the people who've transferred, because of course it's a time of great uncertainty for them. They need to have that collective voice in a new employer. Um, and it's very important that they're there. And I see somebody earlier in the chat said how important their trade union was uh, when Chupi happened. But it's the bad employers who don't want Chupi. It's a bit like um, Shelley's points about migrant workers and not migrant workers themselves, but the exploiting factories and all the rest of it. They're the, the bad employers. We've got to try and get everyone up to this, to accepting the same standards for health, whether it's for health and safety, for Chupi, for collective consultation, for hearing from trade unions, and make sure that um, the, the floor is raised so that all workers are in a better position and there aren't so many people who are left vulnerable and outside the protection of trade union rights. That's great. Thank you, Victoria. Um, the next question is um, for you, Andy. Um, Tony is asking um, that during the pandemic, one issue that has been highlighted is the number of workers forced to work on zero hour contracts. And Tony would like to know whether or not the new working group will look to recommend um, intro uh, to introduce legislation to end zero hour contracts. I think the the uh, the answer to that is yes um, on all fronts because the we've already made that commitment to the. Uh, the, the, the outlawing of zero hours contracts and Kia has repeated that a number of times. So um, it is something that we need to look at in terms of security in the workplace, um, but it's not just zero hour contracts, it's limby workers, it's that disguised self-employment uh, whereby employers are escaping their uh, true responsibilities, the, the real nature of the relationship is one of employer and employee, uh, but it has been cast in different terms simply for the for the purposes of, of, of avoiding the obligations that they would ordinarily uh, be obliged to discharge. So um, uh, certainly the, the whole area of um, security in the workplace and the status of work, um, because as we as we well know, um, so many rights are not universally uh, applicable. So all of those will be under review. The fact that so many people who go to work are not employees, mm -hmm. they are workers and therefore cannot even begin to uh, 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 avail themselves of the remnants of employment rights that, that others can. So that just cannot be uh, sustainable. It's, and it's always the most exposed and the, uh, and the most fragile of circumstances that are, have the weakest uh, protections. Um, so that is not a sustainable position for the 30 working million people in this country. So we will certainly be looking at that root and branch in our review. And I very much welcome contributions to that as we progress. That's great. Thank you, Andy. And then um, I'm just trying to find the final question that we've got time for. Um, one of our uh, sorry, one of our participants this evening is talking about Labour councils and should Labour councils um, be prevented from fire and rehire? Um, I've got to say I'm really, really um, disappointed to hear that any Labour council is using fire and rehire tactics. And I just wonder whether or not this is um, from an outsourced perspective, maybe commission services. So um, I don't know whether our panel just want to end by saying something about outsourced services and the protections for workers there. I mean, obviously I think uh, ultimately the goal would be to see all services back in house um, and you know where people are protected with collective bargaining uh, machinery. But um, Shelley, if I can start with you on that. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, it's funny that that question came up next, because I was thinking that when you asked about zero hours, is that this is something that Labour in power in local government can be doing when it comes to doing contracts with companies. And as you say, 
ideally all public services are run by you know the public sector but often when things like construction and things like that you know they, they do contract out um I think they absolutely should be you know, should be prevented from from using fire when we hire zero hours contracts. I think every every kind of contract there should be a union agreement as well, um, and if possible, signing up to union charters in that particular industry. Um, I think I think I wouldn't stop at fire and rehire and zero hours contracts either. There's a whole number of different issues, you know, that unions have been really successful in getting um, local councils to commit to when, when it comes to their um, procurement contracts. Um, and just uh, just to say, I, I kind of plug um, for, for Labour and local government. We've had some really great initiatives being done by the TUC and, and, and local yeah. councils um, on stay safe at work. Um, so if there's any Labour councillors in the audience tonight, um, please check it out and see if your council could sign up to it. Um, fantastic seeing posters all around towns and cities encouraging people to join a union that's great thanks Shelley and I know that one of um the uh really impressive campaigns that the TUC running at the minute um is the dying to work charter and trying to, to pick up pace around that which is really really important as well um so Victoria if we go to you please thank you again I think I think there's some lessons maybe we can look back to what happened under the GLC, for example, I, mean, I know Greater London Council, um, where they introduced contract compliance, where whereby they used their contracting to ensure that there were minimum workplace standards. I guess now it would be the living, you know, living wage at least, um, but also had requirements for dis you know, anti-discrimination measures. Now, interestingly, um, the Tories outlawed all that saying it was against EU competition law well I don't think we have to worry about that quite so much anymore so it may be that there could be some innovative thinking about how the purchasing power the buying power of local local councils could be used to um, raise employment rights across a local community because of the con various contracts they have um, I, I mean, I, I'm not aware of far and hire in Labour councils, but it's certainly very widely used in local authorities um, as a way of changing terms and conditions. So it's being seen as a way of getting rid of generous terms and conditions, whatever they may be. It's always the very um, highly paid senior officers who think the terms and conditions for the low paid workers are uh, very generous, I, I've noticed. Um, and it is, it is of great concern, and particularly when, you know, the, the proper consultation hasn't been done with the recognised trade unions. And so often employers try not to consult uh, or not to elect employee representatives. And that's, good, that's very much, it's a huge part of our case law at the moment, our casework at the moment, our employers getting rid of people without going through the proper collective consultation. So it's something that should be well up the well up our agenda. Thanks, Victoria. And Andy, over to you. Yeah, I was, I was just thinking that Vicky touched upon it. it it's the issue of consultation. Uh, and some people or some organisations seem to look upon consultation as a burden um, uh, and pay very little uh, adherence to it in any event. Uh, but taking my mind outside the the immediate context of any council of any 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 uh, uh, political colour. Um, there have been uh, success stories in terms of people having to adapt to temporary circumstances that are, are adverse. Um, even in the aviation industry, uh, people who you wouldn't ordinarily expect to be able to come to uh, uh, a sensible agreement for the short term with a promise and a guarantee of a return to the former terms and conditions. Those are the examples of effective consultation uh, are working. But I think we've also got to think outside the box in terms of local authorities in the procurement and the commissioning processes to make sure that trade union recognition forms part of the architecture. Uh, not only that, that it's, it's, it's woven into the governance arrangements so that you have worker representation there so we don't get to these situations where uh, it is a matter of what is going to be done to others. It's yeah. people who have a voice in the first place. And that really goes to the heart of power in the workplace that has been so 
out of kilter for such a very long period of time. And on the issue of outsourcing more broadly, um, I think of some of the successes that we've had in my uh, constituency, working with Unison in particular in the, in the health environment, in successfully on the demise of, of Carillion, getting the uh, uh, services back in house. Uh, and, but that was a successful campaign. And that really was a, a, a shining example of how we can do this. Now, just on that, just think about the comments made from Matt Hancock on it has suddenly become um, a, 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 a given uh, that the National Health Service performs incredibly well uh, as it has done throughout the rollout of this vaccination. Uh, well, we have known of the virtues of the National Health Service for a very long time. We don't need to be educated in it, but the, the conversion, the Damascene conversion to the repeal of the Lansley reforms, I know from people who served in Parliament and who campaigned on the issue, it must be sticking in their throats mm -hmm. this very day to hear from a Tory government that it's they who are going to now uh, reverse the outsourcing, reverse the privatising of our National Health Service. Uh, it, it was wrong then, it's wrong now. Uh, and we will make sure that if there is any um, uh, reformation of the National Health Service, uh, any reconstruction whatsoever, it's done on the correct principles and not some other version of some tawdry Tory deal to, to keep uh, private enterprises uh, coffers filled. It cannot be that. And this pandemic has surely uh, brought that to the fore beyond any doubt whatsoever. But thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. And it most certainly has brought it to the fore uh, loud and clear. Um, I'm going to do um, a little plug as well um, to remind people that um, if you don't follow uh, Labour Unions UK, please do so on Twitter and Facebook. You can also sign up to the email list at labourunions.org.uk. There's also this time next week a trade union election briefing and phone bank. Um, obviously, we've got uh, local elections coming up in May. Um, another issue that is, um, I'm sure, could be the subject of, of another Zoom call in the future about um, why the local elections are going forward in May in the format they are instead of a full postal ballot or, or postponing them. Um, but um, that, as I say, that could be uh, another another evening, uh, another event to do. So um, I'd just like to draw the meeting to a close. And I'd like to thank all our incredible speakers uh, this evening. You've been absolutely wonderful. Um, I'd like to thank Richard, our uh, sign language interpreter, for being with us this evening, doing a wonderful job. Thank you. Um, to Joe Cox and labour unions who have pulled this event together it's really really important that we have this information out in the public domain and of course uh, finally to everyone who has joined us this evening um, our participants thank you for joining us and I'm really sorry that we didn't get to answer all the questions in the chat this evening but I'm sure you'll appreciate that this is a well attended event uh, with lots of interest but hopefully um, we will see you at the next event so thank you very much and take care everyone bye